uh, copy that and put it in their own archives. Can they do that? Technically, I think the answer is no, without some accessory website, YouTube doesn't automatically allow you to download that, Ernie, but it's sort of a question for a later time. It can okay. be done. And certainly if you just ask me for it, I have the original. Oh, but okay. Just normally YouTube doesn't make it so snap easy for people to download their own copy of these things. All right. I think we can start. I, uh, is it? It's nine yes, well, I have nine o'clock, so let's get started. It's nine o'clock, Jane. Are you going to do the uh, uh, recording? I'm sorry, Bernie, the recording started. People are coming in. Uh, but I think you can begin introductions and stuff. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, as I said, we will start with the national anthem and we will recognize our, our, our sponsors. Our sponsor today is uh, for today's meeting is Island Harvest and Island Harvest is being uh, represented by Ra Randy Dresner. Randy, uh, are you, uh, is your mic open and ready to go? Randy, I'm going to, uh, oh, good, good. Okay. I'm, I'm unmuted. Yeah. Great. So should okay, I speak now can, or are you doing uh, the national anthem? Yes, I think we're going to let you uh, uh, speak now okay. and then uh, we'll key in. Well, Ernie, it's a pleasure to, uh, to sponsor uh, the Limba meeting today. And I'm honored uh, that today is the day that uh, Commissioner Hart is speaking. Uh, Island Harvest is a food bank uh, serving people on Long Island every year, uh, but this year during COVID, our work has been uh, exacerbated, if you will. I'm sitting in my car with an orange vest on because we're at today's uh, Bethpage Federal Credit Union turkey collection, which is the largest one-day turkey collection on Long Island. Uh, and we do this event and others because there are so many people who are struggling with hunger um, more, more so now because of COVID. In fact, Island Harvest is helping 100% more people than we have in years past. Uh, between March and the end of September, we have participated in well over 1,000 food distribution events all across Long Island and have heard from so many people who used to be helping us and donating to Island Harvest, and now they find themselves on the other side of the food line. Um, we have distributed uh, enough food to help over 400,000 people across Long Island. Uh, from a business perspective, uh, we have increased the purchasing of food by 500% since March. Now in any business, when you increase your business model by 10, 15%, it's a lot. Ours uh, pivoted by 500%. Um, because we need to be where people are in need. Um, we have become completely mobile and done a lot of mobile distributions and uh, support programs across Long Island. We can't do what we do without Long Island helping, helping us. And business groups like this are always supportive of the work we do. And we always turn to the business community to help us out when we're in need. In fact, today at this very incredible turkey collection, we're already up to almost a thousand turkeys because we've had a number of businesses come by, some bringing 200 and 300 turkeys uh, to help us out. The important thing to know is that, you know, this is a very different year. People are hungry all the time on Long Island and in almost every zip code across our beautiful Long Island. Uh, but this year, COVID has impacted so many more people that used to be contributors and food donors. And now they're on the other side of the line and we're asking for all people um, to turn to Island Harvest to help us out so we can help our neighbors in need. Uh, so thank you for allowing us to be a sponsor for today. And I uh, want to thank yes. you, uh, Randy, for the work you do. It's really very, very important. And, um, you know, uh, somebody sent me an essay to uh, Limba uh, saying uh, we're not in the same boat. We're in the same storm. Some people are doing very well, and and many of us, many of us are really in a in a little kayak, and we're we're struggling, you know. 
Um, some of us are very fortunate though. And it's people like you that, that put your shoulder to the wheel when, when it's necessary and thank you. I wanted to, uh, to uh, introduce our other uh, sponsors. We are sponsored by f uh, four major sponsors, premier sponsors. They're, one of them is Toomey, Latham, Shea, Dubin, and Quantaro. They're a very um, prestigious office of uh, lawyers. And another prestigious office of lawyers is Lewis, Joe's, uh, Avalon, and Aviles. And uh, they have been very generous in keeping our programs going. And Gershaw Recycling, one of the most responsible uh, people in that field that you can think of. And they have been with us for many years. And Covanta Energy, which produces um, energy from uh, waste garbage that would otherwise be trucked off the island. These are all very, very help helpful people and they're the most prestigious in their fields. And I wanna thank them all. I wanna uh, thank uh, the, the commissioner for being with us this morning. Uh, she, was, she will give us a little opening uh, remark, um, but uh, I, I wanted to open up, I did wanna do the um, national anthem. Now we- Yes, I'm ready with that. Okay, Frank. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I want to introduce the uh, speaker this morning. Uh, Commissioner Hart is uh, originally with the FBI, and she led the, the Long Island um, group of uh, the, uh, one of the things she did was the, uh, the gang, um, uh, you know, the abatement program. Uh, you did, uh, you were the supervisor of the gang test task force. And then you became the, um, uh, the, the commissioner, very similar to the uh, uh, career track of uh, your predecessor. And uh, I think uh, we've had you as a guest before, and we're very impressed with what you've been doing. I would like you to give us an opening uh, remark so we can uh, uh, work from there and ask some questions. Uh, good morning. Uh, Great. Thank you. Good morning, Ernie, and uh, good morning to everybody on the on the call. It's great to see you all. I hope you are all well. Uh, I want to begin by, you know, thanking you for have thanking you for having me here today. And also, I want to just recognize uh, Randy, who spoke um, for Island Harvest and the work that they're doing is just incredible. As she uh, she outlined for you, we we try to partner with them um, when we can, and they just really they fill always a need on Long Island, and especially now during COVID. So thank you, Randy, for everything that you're doing. Uh, Normally, I would talk to you about our new initiatives and our, um, you know, our strategies, uh, and that that is all still continuing as we continue to tackle gangs. Uh, as Ernie said, I did extensive work on MS-13 before coming over to the police department. Uh, you know, really, you don't really hear much about MS-13 anymore, and that, there's a reason for that. Uh, you know, together with the D district attorney's office, uh, working very hard to eradicate MS-13 from Suffolk County. Uh, Certainly the uh, opioid epidemic that would continue to, uh, to struggle with and fight against. 
and uh, new initiatives such as human trafficking. However, today, what I want to talk to you about is, uh, is really 2020, which uh, I don't have to tell any of you has been a year like no other. Um, I have heard it said that sometimes nothing happens in the span of a decade, but sometimes a decade happens within a year. And that is very true for 2020 uh, and what we've all faced together. Uh, so I just really want to kind of just touch on um, how the department has uh, addressed some of the challenges that we've had and how we continue to do it um, and always together with, uh, with our partners. So, you know, January uh, 1st came and uh, it seems, you know, forever ago, but we, we initially dealt with bail reform and discovery reform, which went into effect on January 1st of this year. And it was a major uh, change for the Department for Law Enforcement, um, Criminal Justice on Long Island. As many of you know, uh, bail reform uh, entailed um, really just eliminating cash bail altogether. Uh, and then a discovery package that went with it that didn't really gain as much attention, but was really as impactful. And, uh, and it was a, uh, you know, a major switch for us to uh, provide discovery to the uh, defense counsel within five days of an arrest, which was just really unheard of. Um, before that, we had really until the, uh, sometimes the night before the trial, um, depending, but so that really, that was a, uh, in cooperation with the district attorney's office, starting an intake bureau, which was a brand new item for the, for the department where every arrest would go before the ADAs as soon as you made the arrest and all the discovery had to be collected and turned over, including video surveillances, uh, undercover tapes, uh, 911 calls, you name it. So it was a tremendous, uh, undertaking. Next came, of course, uh, in the midst of that, we then were beginning to face COVID uh, as early as January. Um, I look back on our memos internally and our first memo went out to the, to the troops uh, in January uh, talking about COVID and the uh, idea of getting uh, PPI out to them. Uh, and then of course, when March hit, we, uh, we both uh, tackled it as a department internally where we uh, made sure that we had continuity of operations, uh, you know, plans in place to make sure that our most essential uh, programs are still running, that being really the patrol bureau, um, to make sure that uh, we had what, what we needed to be in place to get that uh, continuing to run. And that meant undoubling our double cars. It meant um, having some of the reports go over to Teleserve instead of sending an officer. It meant uh, separating our squads so that they were not working in person. Uh, it meant sending some non-essential workers home. Um, and we really, uh, you know, and I have to give credit to the department and the, the members because they really took this very seriously. Uh, we had very, very low numbers of infection. Uh, up until this latest wave, we only had about uh, 90 uh, positive tests within the entire department. And that's a department of approximately 3,500 people. So they did a tremendous job. They took it seriously. Um, you know, they understood the challenges and, uh, and we just tried to really support them as they went out to continue to com protect our communities and also uh, worry about their families, worry, worrying about bringing this uh, home to them. So internally, we did a lot of work, I, but I want to highlight also externally what we did. Because again, you know, it seems like it's second nature to us now about uh, social distance, face coverings, and uh, washing your hands. Don't forget in March, this is all brand new to a lot of people. Uh, so we tried to look for opportunities where we could partner with our communities and get the word out. So we were we were in our uh, communities uh, where uh, they were heavily Spanish speaking and making sure that we were handing out signs uh, and posting signs in Spanish, just really saying the basics. We had trucks out with our, um, with our PA system, making announcements in Spanish to, to distance and uh, wash your hands and wear face coverings. We, uh, I was on uh, robocalls with superintendents out to all the students and parents to, uh, you know, to take this seriously in, uh, in both in English and Spanish to make sure that they were doing everything they could to protect uh, their families. So, you know, again, it seems like second nature to us now, but this is all coming at us uh, rather quickly. And, uh, and again, really proud of the members of the department for the way they reacted. Uh, of course, our business communities, we were, we were in touch with and making sure that we were on conference calls to make sure that you knew that we were in our downtowns. I, um, I graduated two classes a week early and put them on foot patrols in our downtowns uh, so that they could just interact with our, with our business communities, with our, um, with pedestrians to educate them on, on the importance of, uh, of face coverings and social distancing. Uh, of course, we had an uptick in commercial burglaries and that was of concern to our business community. So making sure that I'm on the phone with the Alliance of Chambers to make sure that we're doing our due diligence and checking uh, you know, our, on our businesses, which were then uh, vacated rather quickly and really were a prime target for, uh, 
you know, for burglaries. So making sure that we were on top of that. Uh, and all, you know, all really in partnership with, uh, with everybody. And it was really uh, quite, a, quite a success uh, in that respect. In the midst we, of that. Uh, oh, I'm just going to interrupt you, but. Uh, no, please. Uh, Commissioner, I, you mentioned that you had an outreach program in the uh, Brentwood uh, community, I believe it was. So it's uh, Brentwood, Central Isola, Pennington, yes. Yeah. And uh, getting them to uh, be aware of uh, the safety measures of the COVID uh, program. What uh, success have you had in, and is it measurable? Because th these are the same people who are exposed to it more than the rest of us, because right. a lot of them work in hospitals and in the service industry, and they're going to be the ones that are going to be exposed to it. So can you measure success and, and give us an idea? Uh, it's difficult to really, you know, measure success, but we know that, uh, you know, as a as a whole, we all work together to really bring down the uh, the curve. I mean, we remember that that was just a constant. I remember in April those conference calls every day that we would have, uh, going over the numbers and how that was just uh, the hospitals were filling up and the capacity that we had left, uh, which was, you know, each day was sometimes seven beds left in uh, intensive care. The uh, trying to get ventilators, so. I will say, you know, I guess as a whole, we all work together to, to bring down that curve, and we hope that we played a, a small role in that and making sure that we're uh, we were out educating. And and really, a lot of it was um, was gaining compliance from uh, from our businesses, who just did a tremendous job. Uh, we had over thirteen thousand calls um, of non-compliance for businesses that we responded to, and I can tell you that it was uh, a, a very very small amount, less than uh, four percent, that were in fact non-compliance. And uh, many times it was just a conversation that we would have, and. Uh, and this, and just the partnership was really incredible. That um, everybody was going through a very difficult time, and just to understand that we were all in this together. In your um, opening remarks, you mentioned the uh, uh, the uh, ruling on uh, uh, bail and uh, what the effects that had. Actually, uh, Peter Gallon, uh, who was in the uh, audience right now, had that question. I don't know if uh, you answered. Peter, are you there? You can un mic. Un un yes, un yes, I am. Uh, did she? Did you get a satisfactory answer, or did you need more some detail? More specifics, please. Okay, go ahead. And ask your question. What effect has the bail reform law had in terms of removing people from from the jail? Uh, the uh, predicted crime wave of these quote criminals unquote who are released out of from the jail and go on to commit all sorts of horrible crimes, according to the opponents of this law. What effect has it really had? Yeah, so, um, you know, I will say that uh, before bail reform, uh, there was a uh, significant drop in the, in the jail population. So there was a 60% drop uh, in Suffolk County in the jail population before bail reform. Um, after it took effect, I can tell you that we've had a 200% a increase in, uh, in those individuals who are released on their own recognizance. So those who are not being held. Uh, it's a significant uh, increase. So uh, what concerns me is really that they're not receiving sometimes the treatment that they need. Um, so many times uh, the homeless population, somebody suffering from a mental health crisis, somebody suffering from uh, some sort of addiction, they would, they, if they stayed in the system, they would get the treatment, uh, whether it be in the jail or along the uh, court ordered supervision piece of it. Uh, that's not happening now. And um, what we have seen is, uh, you know, just the constant uh, person, we arrested somebody, I think three days, three times in one day, um, just for a commercial burglary uh, pattern that he was engaged in. And it was just kind of a constant turnstile uh, in and out of the system. So that's been, that's been a challenge. Um, you know, obviously we're certainly uh, working to make sure that we're continuing to drive down violent crime and it is down. Um, once again, it's down another 9% this year, off record lows of last year. Property crime also is down, but we have seen certainly an increase in, uh, in commercial burglaries. Uh, motor vehicle thefts. Um, so just trying to keep an eye on that. Did I see um, a question from Leah, Leah Arnold? I've yeah. asked you to unmute there. Leah, you should be able to do that. Yeah, um, Commissioner Hart, hi, I'm Leah Arnold. I'm from Eastern Suffolk BOCES. Um, nice to meet you. Uh, the uh, You mentioned there was a 200% increase in the jails. Can you tell me what the 200% increase is? I, I'm, no, my, uh, the increases the individuals that are released on their own recognizance. So uh, whereas last year we had, you know, and really for uh, petit larceny, larceny is a big, um, is a big one. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, the bail, the bail system needed to be reformed, certainly. Uh, uh, 
but that, but the wholesale just kind of um, uh, pulling back on it without any input from law enforcement was troubling. And we are, as you know, the only state in the, in the nation that does not consider dangerousness of the offender uh, for a reason to, uh, to hold them on bail. So that, that really is, uh, you know, is what our uh, major point is. Bail, bail certainly need, needs to be reformed, but the, the idea that it wasn't done in any consultation with law enforcement was, uh, was kind of the troubling piece. Is that going to happen? Uh, I, I'm not really that hopeful, but I will say uh, in July, there were uh, additional uh, offenses that were uh, designated for um, as specified offenses where bail would be uh, a consideration. So they did, they did pull back uh, somewhat and also discovery was uh, added, they added some time on that. So the five days became really in essence, 35 days, which is a, a huge uh, help for us. So there was some recognition that it, uh, it came too fast um, and too extensive, uh, and they have put some guardrails on it. Commissioner, I wanted to uh, talk about <clears throat> the training or the selection of people you put on the beat. Um, I had a very unfortunate situation when I was about 28 years old. I um, went through a, uh, a toll gate on the uh, throughway because there was no attendant there. And 20 miles later, I had a cop behind me, behind me or the trooper behind me, and he pulled me over and I was, you know, I just didn't know what to do. He put a gun to the side of my head and his hand was shaking. I want to tell you something. Nothing concentrates your thoughts like a gun to your head. I did everything precisely as I was told. And that uh, situation worked out, as you can see, I'm here. And, um, but that man was not suited for the job, in my opinion. Certainly. And what, what you do to, to when you're screening people, I mean, there are people, I've known cops that were good cops, like great cops. And Kevin Fallon is a good close friend of mine, as you know, from, uh, from your experience. And he was an excellent cop. I've known cops that were not as good. And I want to tell you something. I think it's very important. This is the entrance point where you get a guy who can um, function in the community and be very effective, or you can have someone who's not. Uh, how, do you, how do you feel about that? I mean, do you think your selection process is good enough? So certainly, uh, you know, and uh, what you said is a, is a tremendous example that not everybody is cut out to be a police officer. Um, and that's really the bottom line. And our job is to make sure that we are selecting those who are in fact suited to serve our communities. Uh, and we, mu we have to have a rigorous process, not only on the front end, where we, uh, we have a very competitive selection process and a very thorough investigation leading up to the hiring process, but also once they come aboard uh, to make sure that we are holding our officers accountable and making sure that anybody who should not be in policing is not in fact um, permitted to be in, in, this, in this profession. Um, and I will say that good police officers feel very strongly about that. And that's probably, uh, you know, the, the really the group that doesn't want bad officers in the most. Uh, so to your point, specifically in Suffolk, it's a very competitive uh, process, as you know. Uh, we just came off a June of 2019 examination, which we offer every four years. Uh, we were really within striking distance of 2015 with our numbers, which were in excess of 17,000 people applying for the job. Uh, that was remarkable, considering that across the nation, there's been double digit dips in, uh, in people signing up to become police officers. Uh, so to be really at the top, uh, again, is, is, is very, uh, is very telling and it's really a result of our recruiting campaign, which was very you know, robust. One of the questions I had uh, asked uh, Commissioner Sini when he was in your position was, um, should there be a standard, uh, a national standard for uh, accepting police officers? And he told me no, and I said, why? And he says, because some people have three people in their police department right. and people have, so others have 3,000 uh, or 35,000 he says and they just don't have the finances to, com to commit to that kind of scrutiny on each what do you think about having a national standard uh, that would be subsidized by the you know the federal government or the local state governments so that even the smallest of uh, police departments could get um, good screening on and good uh, 
uh, you know, standards for uh, police officers. Is that is that something we could do, or is that something that you uh, would agree with, Mr. Sini? Who's uh, it's certainly. I mean, it does run the gamut. Now, people forget that there's 18,000 police departments in the country. Uh, some as small as you said, as three. Some as large as our department, which is the 11th largest in the country. Uh, and we certainly have, uh, you know, the ability and the resources to do a very rigorous screening. Um, many states, to your, to your point, have an accreditation process. Uh, New York certainly does, which is voluntary, but we are part of it, um, where you, you undergo even more stringent uh, oversight and, uh, and review. So we are one of 160 police departments in the state that, uh, that is accredited out of 500 uh, plus. So I'd imagine that every state uh, sh does or should have some sort of accreditation process, to your point, to, um, to make sure that they are doing the most rigorous screening. Here's another thing. I'm a lousy cop in your the jurisdiction, so you fire me. I go to Waco, Texas, and I walk in and I say, you know, I used to have a gun and a badge, and I know how to do this. You're on. So there's a national registry uh, movement <laughs> under, underfoot to make sure that, that we're registering those individuals nationally so that other departments know where, uh, where somebody's coming from that's applying for their position. So that's been discussed. Uh, it, it was part of a, um, an executive order put out by this administration as well, um, nationally. So that, that is underway to create some sort of national database so people understand. It's something that's happening, but it's not done. It's not yeah. done, no, no, but it's certainly underway. That's a good sign. We have a question from the audience, Lynn Elson Nielsen, who's with Nielsen Consulting and Desktop Solutions. Lynn, you're unmuted. Great. Um, Commissioner, I just was curious as to how many uh, of the recommendations from the task force on 21st century policing uh, you guys have implemented. Um, yeah. One of the biggest things from that was the sort of trying to reset the relationship between police officers and members of the community to make it less adversarial. Um, if you could speak about what you've done in, in regards to that, I would appreciate it. Sure, so that really is kind of the, uh, the playbook, the, uh, what you referred to, the, the 21st Century Policing Task Force, the results of that. Uh, and in it, as you said, it does say, uh, you know, the most effective means to really uh, make sure that we're policing in a proper way, uh, in a legitimate way, is to, is to partner with our communities in that effort. So we've done a tremendous amount of work uh, in, that, in that vein, beginning with uh, Tim Sini as commissioner and of course continuing under, uh, under my leadership. It is, it's imperative that we, uh, that we do that together. I can tell you that our Community Relations Bureau is, is fantastic uh, and they're out all the time connecting with our communities. But what I would like to see and what we've begun to do is push that idea really down to the, uh, to the grassroots, down to the patrol officers and make it part of our DNA that this is really how we, how we do business. And a small, a small uh, example I can give you of that is um, the memo book of the police officers. So they, they fill out, uh, usually by hand, a, a memo book of all their activities during the day, uh, whatever it might be. We made that electronic, uh, which is much easier for them. But really, as part of that, we made a drop down where you can select community engagement. So when you get out of the car, and we encourage you, stop the car, get out of the car, engage with the community, uh, whether it's, you know, a pickup game of basketball or, or a conversation with a merchant, whatever it might be. Engage in that, get back in your car and um, you know, note, it, note that on the dropdown, community engagement, and that will, that will generate a stat for you. So you know, as much as we talk about arrests and, and summonses, it's time that we count community engagement too as a statistic. And when you look to be promoted, we're gonna look at that and see that you have embraced that, that piece of your uh, obligation. So that's a very small piece. We've done a, a number of other uh, items we have community liaison officers, as you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, just try to really, as your, your point is, that's, that's really how you move, move the needle. Um, and it's more important now than ever. Uh, and just the example that I gave at the, uh, at the top of this, where, you know, community policing at its essence is not just, you know, attending fairs and having picnics uh, with, your, with your community. It's about identifying problems and solving them together. So, you know, with the idea of COVID, this was a major problem that we were all undergoing. How do we get out there and communicate and, and serve and, and partner with our communities to make it, uh, you know, to make a difference? And we, we did that with Island Harvest. Many times we were out, uh, you know, on the lines and making sure that we, uh, we were helping out with food distribution. We were doing it, like I said, with the, uh, with the Spanish speaking population. Um, so really it just has to be part of the DNA of the department to your point. Thank you. 
Leah, you're unmuted and you have a follow another question similar, I think, follow up. Yes, actually, um, thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner Hart, I, uh, as I mentioned, I work for Eastern Suffolk BOCES um, and hearing you talk about community relations and the work um, and the importance of um, uh, police officers working in their communities and working community relations, I can hear that echoed in our law enforcement teachers and the way that they speak about law enforcement with our, um, with our classes. Um, one of the questions um, that we've been um, kind of wrestling with, and, and I think we all have been in, in kind of this nation with all the civil unrest and the concerns about um, race relations and um, you know, Black Lives Matter, the governor asked uh, um, you know, the, the, the New York State, the communities get involved in you know, kind of um, giving their, their local law enforcement some direction and, and the how, how is that happening in Suffolk County? Yeah, no, I'm glad you raised that. So uh, as part of, uh, as you mentioned, um, you know, following the civil unrest, we had uh, over 200 protests here in Suffolk County, about 240 plus uh, with 22,000 participants. Um, really just uh, remarkable, no property damage whatsoever, really no uh, major incidences to speak of. Again, going back to the community policing piece, and I'll get to your, your specific question in a moment, but I wanted to raise the issue of uh, you know, once, um, and there were weeks and weeks where the um, protesters were utilizing the roadways and, and we understood that that was, uh, was necessary and we wanted to protect them to do that. And then it got to the point where it's getting dangerous. We had a, um, a protester hit in Huntington. So we needed to really kind of start to begin to clear the roadways. Uh, one idea that we sat as a, as a command staff and said, you know, how do, we, how do we do this without kind of criminalizing it? Because, it, you know, you hate to, to do a disorderly conduct arrest or uh, or issue a criminal summons. So what we decided to do, which was kind of unique um, and goes to uh, to the earlier point was we used the vehicle and traffic law, which um, prohibits pedestrians from uh, blocking the roadways. So we actually just issued a ticket um, and it didn't criminalize uh, their, you know, their first amendment rights and their participation in these really important protests. So we thought that was a, a good kind of um, unique way to, to handle it. But to your point, uh, the governor did issue an executive order to reimagine and reform policing to every police department in New York State. So of the 500 plus, uh, the order came down to sit down with your communities, um, to listen and to learn from your communities and to hear from them uh, and decide what you can do together to get their input, uh, which is so important, to make real changes uh, in the department. And it, for us, it's a real opportunity. So we, we formed a task force, it's uh, 36 members, uh, we have met seven times on, uh, on different issues, uh, ranging from officer accountability to recruitment, to, um, to traffic stops, to uh, the, last, the last one was arrests and search warrants. Sit down with them, uh, go over what we have in place so that they have some understanding of where we are as a department and then hear from them and what they, what they think uh, could be done better. That's gonna now break into um, smaller groups where they're gonna take uh, some information that we've provided them and uh, some dialogue, and then they're gonna come up with what they uh, hope to be some solutions. And then we're gonna get back together again. Uh, during all that, um, as, as, that, as that is continuing to move forward, uh, we've had listening sessions uh, just with the communities. So we sat, we just finished our fourth one and we've done three hours a piece of, uh, of just sitting, really just listening, um, not, not engaging in a, a back and forth dialogue, but just uh, to hear from them and their encounters with the police and what what they feel could be done better. Uh, so we just finished that. So that's 12 hours of that. Um, and we have three more to go. So another 12 hours. And, uh, and it's been, you know, very helpful for the most part. It's, um, you know, really, when you really, and I've always found it a challenge in this job to really get down and talk to the community members. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll have the advocates. Um, there's, no, there's no shortage and they, they are not shy about uh, meeting with me and their opinions and they should be. But uh, I really, I really value that one-on-one -on -one conversation with the community member who, uh, who like Ernie said, had a, he had a terrible experience um, with the police. And then, you know, I wanna hear about what they're doing and, uh, and if they've had that kind of experience. We also sent out a community survey as part of the uh, executive order when it kicked off uh, to those who had contact with the police in the past and then random calls to maybe those who have not. And, and we wanna hear back from them uh, with that community input. Um, so that we can really, you know, make some good decisions. And it, it is an opportunity now. You know, some people uh, say, oh my God, reform, how horrible, what are we gonna do? It's, that's not it. It's, it's an opportunity to do a better job. And we've embraced reform uh, in recent years and we're gonna continue to do that to become a better department. And that's what every department should be doing uh, constantly, not just when there's a, a crisis situation, but really all, all the time, just, you know, reinventing and reimagining how they can do a better job. 
Commissioner, um, I would offer if you ever want to hear from 51 school district um, students in our law enforcement program, uh, we'd love to. We can set up a Zoom anytime. Um, I'm sure I they'd love, love to do that. There. I really, I would love to do that. That is, first of all, it's one of my favorite parts of the job is dealing with students, you know, because they're so, they're just so earnest and they're so, uh, you know, genuine. So uh, I would love to do that. Excellent. I'll, Thank you. I'll have Felix reach out. So our next question is from Peter Gollin. Thank you for appearing. I've got a, a, a couple of questions, some easy, some hard. Uh, first, what it's been most of a year since undocumented aliens have been able to get uh, driver's licenses under the green light law. So at least they're not guilty of driving without a license. What's been the impact in, in Suffolk? Yeah, so, uh, you know, as you know, part of the summonses that we were issuing were unlicensed drivers. And, uh, and a lot of that was impacting uh, communities of color uh, disproportionately because of exactly what you said. So we're hoping that that uh, disparity closes to some degree uh, based on the new law. I don't have that data uh, available, but I'm imagining that that's gonna make a significant difference. Uh, thank you. Other question is what's your email address so we can send you uh, documents and stuff of that sort for not, not relating to cases, but relating to ideas for improving the department. Yeah, so it's uh, geraldine.hart at Suffolk County, ny.gov. Thank you. The other third question would be, are you concluding revised memoranda of understanding with the school districts regarding uh, the on-site officers, school, school resource officers, as they're called, who are actually police officers? Yes, so uh, just by way of history on that. So uh, Peter's talking about the uh, MOUs that we're doing with the school districts. Um, so initially we did, uh, before any of this came out from the state uh, requiring an MOU, we did a uh, roles and responsibilities with all of our superintendents. So we sat down together and went over, you know, exactly the expectations that we have of one another. That got codified into an MOU after the, um, after the government, uh, I, I believe it was the attorney general asked for an MOU from all uh, school districts. So then we did uh, really just the roles and responsibilities codified into a, uh, an MOU and that's been, that's been out and, uh, and back for most districts. Thank you. Jay Ryan, you're unmuted and ready to go. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. <clears throat> um, you said earlier that uh, no one wants to get rid of the bad cops more than the good cops. And every time there's kind of a, let's call it a destabilizing incident like George Floyd, they, they quite often they find that that cop has previous bad incidents, but he's been protected by union rules. Is that something that can be addressed on the local level or is that a national problem? Uh, so every jurisdiction is different in that respect. Um, Suffolk County is part of the major city chiefs association, which is the top 60, uh, about 65 departments in the nation. And we, we Zoom conference call and get together often. Uh, and just to hear from them, the different, it's, it's really a patchwork of different, uh, different rules and regulations throughout the country. Some, some jurisdictions have the ability to fire uh, immediately an officer. Others, uh, you know, require, um, especially in the Northeast, a, uh, it's really just a suspension and then a, uh, a process of, a, that of an investigation. And then many times it goes before an arbitrator. So uh, this region is a little bit different in that respect from uh, some other regions. Um, and it's certainly part of our discussions that we're having uh, that Leah mentioned as part of the governor's executive order for reforming the police. It's been a it's definitely been a topic of discussion. How tight are your hands? If you, you know, if you have a guy who's had two, three, you know, questionable incidents, how, how hard is it for you to act against that guy or gal? Yeah, um, so I think people, many people will be surprised to know that I cannot fire somebody uh, just off the bat. Uh, you know, I, I, I come from the FBI where uh, there, were, there was no union, there was no, uh, there was really a very, very little uh, oversight at all, um, as far as an association or a union. So, so here it, it is different. Um, I can suspend and, uh, without pay, and I do that uh, as appropriate. Um, but then, really, it, it has to uh, go before an arbitrator if they don't agree to uh, to resign. So that's that's been the challenge, um, you know. But uh, again, it can be a very like, expensive uh, process, can it? I'm sorry. Uh, going before the arbitrator, that could be a very expensive uh, and lengthy, drawn-out process. Certainly, certainly lengthy, yeah. Firing a school teacher. 
and, uh, and into my knowledge anyway. Yeah, so it's, it's you know, definitely part of the discussion. It's, uh, it's challenging, but, um, you know, it's important to work together with the unions and, uh, and we definitely have a, a healthy relationship, which, uh, you know, which is definitely good for everybody, I think, as we kind of move through this together and make sure that- I have a lot of sympathy for unions. I used to be an elected official in a union when I was a young man. And, uh, but, uh, you know, you have to have your power too. Certainly. We have a question from Jay Ryan. So that was, I was the last one, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Dan, then. I got myself mixed up, sorry. Danny, with us still, you, you were gonna ask, actually, I know his question, which was, uh, he hadn't heard much about MS-13 lately. What's the latest status? Yeah, so uh, as you know, we had unprecedented violent activity with MS-13 in, uh, in 16 and 17. Um, we have not had a, uh, an MS-13 homicide in 2020. We, have, uh, we had one in 19. Uh, and when we look back to 16 and 17, we had uh, more than 17. So there's been a concerted effort on the part of this department together with uh, the district attorney's office, the Eastern District of New York, using our federal partners, the FBI gang task force, to eradicate MS-13 from our neighborhoods. And, uh, and I will say that they have been, uh, they are on their knees and, uh, and we will continue the pressure. And I think in the past, um, you know, many departments would, uh, would have success and then move on to the, you know, what, what the next issue was in front of them, which is, you know, many in, in law enforcement. But the key is to really uh, have a continual pressure to ensure that they do not reconstitute because uh, what happens is we'll wipe, we'll wipe out the entire clique or the leadership of the clique and then you'll have individuals coming up from El Salvador to reconstitute those cliques. It is, has to be a sustained uh, pressure and that is in place now and, uh, and will remain so. Bill Miller has a question. Bill, you should be unmuted already according to my screen. Is that right? Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, now I'm good. good. Yeah, well, thank go. you, Commissioner, for being with us today. Um, and recently, just reading the newspapers, uh, Mr. Ballone's uh, budget for 2021, how will that affect the Suffolk County Police Department? Yeah, so there were some major, uh, major cuts uh, to the department. Um, Right off the bat, we usually have a class in uh, in November, so we would have had a class put in this month. Uh, that's been postponed, and uh, and the next class has been canceled as well. Uh, to the earlier point, school resource officers are going to be cut in July if we don't get uh, any sort of federal funding. Uh, so that's been uh, uh, you know uh, a major uh, result of this of this budget, and then also our um, our community uh, officers as well. Some of our um, uh, I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry. Our CSU officers are out who are really on the, on the front line of like, you know, just identifying problems that uh, community members are having and, and, uh, and doing the quality of life enforcement that is so important. So, you know, we are uh, concerned, very concerned, and we want to make sure that, uh, that we, if possible, get some funding into this, uh, into this department, because as you know, retirements keep coming. And if we don't backfill them with, uh, with new recruits, we're going to have, uh, the lowest levels of personnel that we've had in years, and uh, and that creates a, a lot of overtime. So, um, you know, we're we're very concerned, and we want to make sure that uh, that those classes get put back in place, and that SROs who do a remarkable job, um, it's it's really a tremendous program that they are not affected. Knowing that personnel is so important, um, how will it affect the equipment of the Suffolk County Police Department? Yeah, I mean it's. Uh, it's troubling because the, the entire operating budget has been reduced significantly. And the operating budget is where we not only pay at a payroll, but we also uh, purchase equipment to your point. So we're looking for opportunities to make sure that we're continuing to obviously do our best to keep everybody safe. So we're looking for grant opportunities to fill those gaps um, and making sure that we're still doing the, uh, the number one job that we're doing, which is keeping everybody safe. And we've been very successful in doing that. So we're gonna continue to, to do that, but uh, but are hopeful that, uh, that some money comes in from the federal government. Thank you very much. Commissioner, this is Frank and Virgil from Desktop Solutions. I just had a question occur to me, and I think it, Spanish language and uh, hiring of Spanish language and keeping uh, that percentage up must be a challenge and yet imperative uh, you know, with the community, 
that we're dealing with in Suffolk County. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so uh, language access has been a huge uh, uh, piece of our effort, um, again, to engage with our community because we need to make sure that we understand each other. Uh, so we're able to hire 10% um, off a Spanish speaking police list of every class. So every class um, will have at least 10% of that class who are Spanish speaking. And that's been, that's been a, uh, an excellent asset for us. Uh, it's really moved the numbers up um, in the department of, uh, of people of color. Um, and we're continuing to do that because we really need to diversify this department. Uh, and we're taking steps, important steps to do that. Um, so we're, our bilingual uh, officers who speak uh, Spanish it has increased dramatically. I imagine that must be crucial. Uh Ernie, I accidentally muted you. You figured it out. Sorry. And then you're next. Go ahead. Your, your mic is on. I'm sorry. I'm, Commissioner, I'm sorry to give me credit. <laughs> Go ahead, Lynn. Commissioner, my dad was a parole agent in the state of Michigan for a bunch of years. And one of his biggest challenges was mental health in his parolee population. And he worked quite closely with police officers when he had a parolee that was unmedicated or was having an issue or whatever. But I hear from police officers that I know that, you know, the increase in people with mental health issues and the lack of resources is a real challenge. Can you tell me what the, what your vision is for how we solve that issue so that police officers can either have better training or we can, you know, do better resources for dealing with these unfortunate people. Yeah, and you bring up a great point. Um, that's, that's a major piece of this uh, reform effort because uh, as we know, you know, all of this has kind of broken down to the point where we are the only ones responding to these, these type of uh, mental health crises. And there's, there, the numbers are, are significant. Um, yeah. So you know, what can we do uh, to make sure that we're doing that well and safely and make sure, or making sure that we have uh, partners assisting us with that. And that's been, as you know, a movement around the country uh, to have uh, mental health experts uh, who can respond to some of these calls. So that's definitely part of the discussion. I will say that we do uh, CIT training, which is uh, crisis intervention training, which is, uh, which is uh, unique uh, to our department. Um, I don't know how many departments do that, but what I've been doing is making sure that uh, at least one CIT trained officer is in every squad so that we have somebody responding who has specific training on how to deal with somebody with a mental health, health issue. But I will say to your point also, um, you know, how do we do this uh, better? And how do we, you know, I know there's been a co-responding model out there. Oregon is a, is a great example of it where they, the 911 dispatcher actually sends out uh, mental health experts to certain uh, calls, uh, 911 yeah. calls. That's an option, but then I, I also think that we should think about, uh, you know, uh, proactively having uh, a mental health crisis team respond. So when we, you know, when we, ha and I looked at the numbers, some of it's astounding. When we have um, a person with a mental uh, health issue and we responded 27 times to that house, uh, you know, within a two month period, it's, it's time to say, you know what, we need to have a crisis intervention team meeting with this person before 911 is called. Uh, so maybe we can, there's space there for a proactive response where they can uh, proactively, and I know they do a great job. I mean, DASH does a tremendous job um, and they, and we do have mental health crisis teams in place, but uh, to boost those up and make sure that, uh, that before that person has to pick up the phone, before things have really uh, failed tremendously, that there's been some, uh, some intervention on that. Um, so really that's, it's, it's a big part of our, our reform effort because it is a large piece of what we do. We used to warehouse them in Pilgrim State and places like that. And um, what we came to the conclusion that a lot of these people could be medicated and put on the street. And uh, one day when the, the supervisor of the town of Islip was Frank Jones, he said half of them wound up on the streets of Babylon. And I yelled out, and the other half went into politics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seems that way sometimes. So. I've been waiting all these decades to reuse that line, Ernie. <laughs> so I have a question, Commissioner, and I, I hate to be the one to sort of lob the grenade into the meeting, but the defund the police movement. Um, I'm going to ask a specific question, though, and I think it relates to what <clears throat> I just asked, because as I read into that, uh, obviously taken on face value, nobody truly wants no police in this defund movement. But one of the most common things that 
is cited where it's been successful has been in the kind of example that you were just describing where mental health is budgeted mm -hmm. and dispatched rather than it not even being in the budget in the first place. So my question to you is, in, and I'm sure you have read into defund the police beyond just the slogan. Have you seen anything in it that is of any value to be discussed or do you just discount the whole thing? No, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's always important to, to know uh, all of the points of an argument. Um, I will say the biggest piece to come out of it seems to be the, uh, the reallocation of resources towards mental, mental health, which is a positive. Um, I don't think you'll find an officer who thinks that we should have sole responsibility uh, for that, you know, uh, it takes up a, a large amount of our time. It's, it's difficult to have the training necessary to do it. Uh, but we my concern from the beginning with the idea of defunding the police has been uh, the disparate impact that it would have on communities that need, need uh, police services because other services perhaps have failed in other communities. Uh, so to kind of rip off that Band-Aid and say, you're not gonna receive police services anymore either, um, I think is a bit of a, a harsh, um, a harsh result. But I do think that defunding the police means different things to different people. Uh, and it certainly is uh, nothing that we would support, of course, as a department. Um, but looking just for avenues where we can uh, partner and, and increase resources in other areas so that, uh, so that we can all serve uh, our communities better. And I think mental wellness is, uh, is certainly a piece of that. And it's been deployed. I think Newark is the example that keeps coming up. It was just, uh, you know, in disarray. And the only way really to rebuild it was to defund it, but of course that's well, that was uh, yeah that was Camden. Camden, Camden had a uh, yeah, and then Newark uh, was under a um, a consent decree that was uh, very stringent as well. What did they do, Frank? Well, they basically said, look, we're going to take the budget away and reevaluate all the money we're spending and rebuild it from the ground up. Really, on paper, fire everybody and rehire them again in their most appropriate position, and it worked in that example, but it was a very extreme example. And yeah. the slogan has doesn't take any of that nuance into effect. So it's really one of the worst bumper stickers ever invented, you know? Right. right. Agreed. Because there's yeah. a good conversation to be had is my point that that I'd like to see, you know, even people beyond your expertise level understand. Um, so we have a question. I'm just going to read it out from Dan Sherry. How are things in Minneapolis now? They defunded apparently. Is that true? Uh, so they, they had passed legislation to defund in Minneapolis, but the, uh, there was a charter provision that would not permit it. Uh, and I think they pushed the vote until 2021, if I'm not mistaken. So in fact, that's a specious example at this point in time. Yeah, but they're having problems, uh, be retaining personnel because they're having retirements, uh, and resignations in droves and they're bringing in, uh, officers from other departments to fill the gaps. So they're, uh, that's, that's another issue that they're having in, uh, in Minneapolis. So I have one more question and it's on a little lighter note. So maybe it's a good thing to, uh, we have five, a little bit more than five minutes. Yesterday's paper featured a piece of considered legislation about these kids that are wilding on bikes in the middle of the road. And I don't know if anybody has seen any of these videos or encountered it. It really is heart stopping as a driver. These kids go out in packs of bicycles and pop wheelies down the yellow line or purposely veering into oncoming traffic. But the article seemed to say that there's no reason for new legislation. You just simply have to apply what's already on the books. So where do you stand on that? Yeah, so, and we've had uh, some instances of that, particularly in the first precinct uh, in, the, in the warmer weather. Um, and we do obviously, you know, uh, we try to get out there and make sure that we're uh, addressing it, uh, obviously. Nassau has uh, similar legislation on the books. Um, I'm not sure that they've issued any uh, specific tickets under it, and maybe that was the point of the of the article to say that uh, it's not necessary. You know, <clears throat> out in Fire Island, where I had a house for many years, uh, over in Cherry Grove, they had uh, the police would come and play volleyball with the locals <laughs> because there was a little tension there. That tension went away when people realized that they're dealing with other yeah. people. Exactly. Exactly. And as the commissioner said, now there's a thing on the app where the, the officers can give themselves credit for that. I, you said that was a small thing. That's no small thing. Anyone who's ever managed people know that if you don't give them credit for it and make it part of the feedback loop, then that's how they prioritize what they do every day. No, that's absolutely true. Uh... 
Oh, I'm sorry. Did I, I, I muted you accidentally. Somebody just came in the waiting room and I. No worries. Um, so yeah, and to your point, you know, how do we uh, really reward and incentivize uh, problem solving? Because that's really what we do every day is, uh, is problem solve uh, together with the community. So just looking for avenues that we can, you know, make sure that people understand that that's a priority uh, here. And, uh, and I do, I have to say, you know, it's been incredible coming over to this department from an outsider perspective. I mean, many times commissioners and chiefs will come up to the ranks and take over the department. Uh, I came over completely from the outside uh, from a federal uh, position, which is, uh, which is very different too. And I just have to really comment on the resiliency and the professionalism of this department. Um, you know, I know policing is under uh, intense scrutiny uh, throughout the country, uh, intense criticism, sometimes unwarranted, uh, you know, many times specifically warranted in, in other uh, situations across the nation. But, you know, we are open to that idea that uh, reform is an ongoing process. Uh, the officers here embrace it. Uh, it's a very professional department. It's, um, it's really remarkable, some of the work that they do uh, every day that doesn't get any publicity or press. Um, so I have been honored to have this position and lead this department. And, uh, and I think that all of you and all uh, residents in Suffolk County, and I say it every time that I can, should be very, very proud of this department that continues to do extraordinary work in very difficult times. My own experience as a Suffolk resident has been very positive. I, I, maybe I'll take the opportunity to ask the last question. What would you say is your number one challenge having taken this new position from the FBI? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously 2020 kind of is a challenge on its own uh, and everything that's come with it. But uh, really when I, when I came over, my biggest challenge was communication, uh, communicating with the department because it's so big and vast. Uh, and really, you know, in the bureau, you can send out an email and you're gonna to touch everybody in the office. Uh, here, you know, you have the squad cars, many don't even uh, have an email uh, that they are able to access. So how do I communicate? Um, and I've, I struggled with that in the beginning. I did it a lot in person. Uh, before COVID, and that was helpful just to get out and meet the troops and, uh, you know, and again, just get to know each other because I'm a, a complete unknown to them. Um, and, and I wanted to get to know uh, them and their concerns. So did that a lot in person when COVID struck. I uh, was trying to find a way to do that. I, I did some videos, but that wasn't uh, as great. Um, just techno the technology wasn't terrific. So what I do now, and it sounds very simple again, is, uh, is I send out a message on the MDC every Friday, which is the you know, the patrol officer gets that uh, on his screen or her screen. And then uh, it's same messages emailed out to the troops. And it's really, it began just to update them on, uh, you know, here's our COVID numbers, here's how we're doing, um, keep up the good work. And, and now it's really, you know, morphed into kind of a, uh, a very broad, um, you know, uh, talking to them about concerns that we're having uh, or what I'm seeing in the, in the public or um, whatever, it runs the gamut. Um, but anyway, it's been a tremendous, uh, device for me to communicate. So communication was the, was the first one, I'd say. I think we want to uh, uh, make our closing remarks at this time. First of all, I want to thank uh, the commissioner for being with us today. I've uh, had, we've had her as a guest before, and I feel like we've gotten to learn more about her thinking uh, this time than we did the, even the last time. You were kind of new when I had you yeah. the first time. And I think you've, uh, you're settled in. You're, I'm you're, settled in. And you're, yeah. You're um, you're comfortable with the with the position that you hold, and I th I think you uh, from what I can tell you're doing a good job, and uh, you know you're satisfying the needs of the community, but you're doing it with the uh, with the, the support of your own team, and that's the important thing because that's the way it, it continues to, to yeah. improve. Um, I will. What, I want to uh, mention that we're going to have John Bruckner next time. And uh, they, that uh, program is being actually sponsored by the, uh, the union, the EIBW 1049 Electrical Union. And I hope everybody will be on board. Uh, Frank or Bill, do you have a, a closing statement that you'd like to say? I'd like to wish everyone a safe and happy uh, holiday Thanksgiving. Good point, Bill. Yes. Stay Have safe. Everybody wash your hands. Cover your face. <laughs> okay. right. Be well. Thank you again, Thank Commissioner. You. Thank you. Thank you Take so care, much, everybody. Commissioner. All right. Stay safe. Great job. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. We're done, Frank. Yep. Closing up the meeting. Thank you, everyone. Be well.